you know. Ladies and <laughs> gentlemen, welcome to the Hong Kong Foreign Correspondents Club lunch event. My name is Hanna Minatanninen, and I am the Hong Kong correspondent for the leading Finnish financial newspaper Kaupalehti. I am also uh, Foreign Correspondents Club's um, vice president. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming today, and thank you for your continuous support to the club. We do take all the coronavirus um, restrictions and measurements very, very seriously, as we do want to do our part to protect our community from the virus that is still going on around the world. But we would also like to extend our thanks to our kind members, you guys, for for being patient with the with the new restrictions, and we're very, very happy to see you here uh, in big numbers, but also with very strict coronavirus safety protocols. We do organize uh, lunch events regularly. We have, and we're all very lucky to be here today because we're fully sold out with the waiting list. We will have another lunch event after the Chinese New Year that is also sold out with the waiting list, but rest assured we are continuously working hard to bring more lunch events. So thank you for your support and thank you for coming today. Today we have a very interesting talk on the Scottish botanist who stole the tea of China. This story will take us from British India to Ireland. Um, today we are very, very happy to welcome our guest speaker, uh, Mr. Mark O'Neill, who has worked as a journalist for over 30 years in different parts of Asia. He's been writing for Reuters and South China Morning Post, to name a few. Um, this talk will be moderated, and this whole event was also organized by our brilliant associate governor, Mr. Richard David Winter. So once again, thank you for coming. Uh, we will have a Q&A uh, &A session after the conversation. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much for coming along today. I first became aware of Robert uh, Fortune when I was in that lovely uh, tranquil oasis in London, in Chiswick, in uh, Chelsea, in the Physic Gardens. I recommend you all go there. And if you do go there, you'll be amazed by the plant collection, and you'll be quite surprised by how many plaques there are dedicated to Robert Fortune, the Scottish botanist who I'd never heard of. So after that, I did some research, and I got really fascinated by his relationship with tea, with black tea. And very, very briefly, because I know I'm not trespassing here on uh, Mark's speech, but very briefly, the government in Victorian times was worried about alcoholism in the working classes, especially the gin bars on corners outside factories. So typically you would go along, you'd tank up with gin, and then you'd work 12 hours a day. And during that 12 hours, you probably, or you could well fall into the machinery. And this was causing a lot of concern to parliament. So they actually passed uh, legislation to subsidize tea. And the clipper ships, which went back and forwards, were partly subsidized by the government. So last year, I was listening to RTHK, and I heard um, Anne-Marie Evans interviewing Mark about black tea and about Robert Fortune. So I thought, this is a really interesting subject, and uh, the FCC would love to hear more. So please enjoy the rest of your lunch. Enjoy the, uh, the cups of tea you're, you're drinking now, which have got milk and sugar in them, which of course is correct. Enjoy that. And please give a warm welcome to Mark. Please uh, pay attention to this uh, wonderful cup of tea that we have, that the uh, club kindly arranged for us. Now, this is the legacy of Mr. Robert Fortune. Now, all my Chinese friends would never drink such a cup, because it has milk and it has sugar. But this is the tea which, to which the British and the Irish public became addicted. And that is the legacy of Mr. Robert Fortune. So we thought it appropriate that today everyone be given a cup so you can savor what he did, okay? Anyway, thank you very much for your invitation today. Uh, it's always a great pleasure to come here. I've done it several times, and it's the best platform that we have in, uh, in Hong Kong. 
And I also thank you for coming during this COVID time. So it's very nice of you to take the time to come. And just before we speak about Robert's fortune, Richard kindly said that we could offer for sale here um, my latest book. It's about Hu Shi, the famous Chinese public intellectual of the 20th century. So I'll just speak about him for one minute. He was the pioneer of the vernacular Chinese. The Chinese that we speak today is the vernacular Chinese. Before Hu Shi, it was classical Chinese, Wen Yun Wen. And he was the main person that changed the language that was used for written Chinese into vernacular Chinese. So that was one of his greatest contributions to China. He was educated for seven years in the United States, and he brought back with him many advanced ideas, family planning, sexual equality between men and women, the right of people to choose their own spouses. He was a professor at Beijing University. He was then the Chancellor of Beijing University after World War II. And during World War II, he was ambassador of China in Washington. And in December 1941, President Roosevelt was about to sign a treaty with Japan, which would have averted the attack on Pearl Harbor. But Hu Shi went in to see the president, and for the first time in his life, he lost his temper. He said, you cannot sign this agreement because it does not contain any conditions for Japan to withdraw its army from China. And he persuaded Roosevelt not to sign it. So the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. So I think we can say that this act by Hu Shi saved China. China would not have won the war without that. Anyway, I won't speak any more, but please, if you'd like to buy a coffee, you're very welcome. Okay. So. <clears throat> now, let's just speak about um, Robert Fortune. Now, he was the man who brought the teas of China to India, where they were grown in Assam and Darjeeling in northeast India, and India became the world's largest tea producer. So before Fortune went to China, China had the virtual monopoly on tea production in the world. And after he went and brought the tea back, India was able to overtake it. And he not only brought with him the seeds and the plants, he hired eight excellent tea experts from China to come and help the Indians to grow the tea. And he brought also the whole manufacturing process with him. Because as you know, tea is not a simple product. It's a very complicated product to produce. So he brought with him from China ovens, woks, rolling tables, and other items that were needed to make the tea. So he made an extraordinary contribution. Now, of course, if you're a Chinese person, you may look at this from completely the opposite point of view. You may say it is the biggest intellectual property theft in history. And of course, Fortune and the East India Company that hired him did not pay one penny of copyright or compensation to China for doing this. Anyway, this is a matter we can discuss at the end, okay? So here's a photograph of him in middle age. And I wanted to give you just some images of the impact he had. He made Britain and Ireland addicted to tea. And he made the whole of the population addicted to tea. Prior to his going to China, tea was very popular in Europe, but it was a, it was a, a very expensive item. It was only for the ruling class, for the nobility. But he turned it into a mass consumption product. So this would be a typical picture of uh, working women in England enjoying their tea break in the afternoon. And this is a photo of the upper class ladies enjoying their tea. And if you'll allow me to give a couple of uh, stories about that. I had an upper class relative uh, who was wealthy. She never did any uh, work in her life. But she used to have afternoon tea every day around four. So sometimes I would join her for this. And one day I was preparing the tea for her. And I made a terrible mistake. I poured the milk first. And she became very angry. She said, what are you doing? You can't do that. I said, well, why? She said, N-O-C-D. 
I said, what do you mean NOCD? Not our class, darling. <laughs> what do you mean? She said, MIF. I said, what is MIF? Milk in first. And what she meant to say is that people like her, of course, put the tea in first and then the milk. But the working people, they put the, the milk in first. So tea came to have a great etiquette involved in the drinking of it, okay? Uh, as Richard said, the British government greatly encouraged the growth of the tea industry, to, partly to replace gin, partly to replace beer. And as you know, at the same time, British, Britain had many colonies in the West Indies which used slave labor. And they produced enormous amounts of sugar at almost no cost. And this sugar was brought to the UK. So what happened was the tea from India and the sugar from the Caribbean, they were put together to create this new drink. So that's the sugary milk tea. And this is the one that was promoted uh, right across all classes. Now, Fortune was born into a, a very modest family. His father was a farm worker in Berwickshire in the south of Scotland. Then he was very interested in plants, so he went to work in the Royal Botanical Gardens in Edinburgh. Have any of you been there? It's a very wonderful garden. So he started there, and then he was hired by the Royal Horticultural Society in London, so he moved there with his family. And just after the Opium Wars, so China had only opened the door, but very, to a slight extent, and the RHS sent him to China for three years to collect plants. So there was two purposes for this mission. One was a sort of scientific purpose, to take the opportunity of being able to go to China for the first time and collect a lot of plants and flowers that had never been seen before in the West. But the second purpose was a commercial one, because wealthy people in Europe were very happy to buy these plants. So it was, it was both a scientific mission, but it was also a commercial mission. So uh, Fortune spends three years in China visiting many different uh, districts, especially Yunnan. You know, Yunnan in the south has half of China's biodiversity. So during this time, he, he, he learned quite a, a lot of Chinese. He became quite familiar with the Chinese system, how people behaved, Chinese manners, and... He completed his work and he goes back to, to London. Now, this is a photo taken in the Royal Botanical Gardens in Edinburgh, and it's called the, the, the uh, Chinese, 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 Chinese hillside, sorry, Chinese hillside. Now, this garden in Edinburgh has the biggest collection of Chinese plants outside of China. So he made a contribution toward that. So I want to show you two images of this uh, Chinese hillside. So this is a very positive aspect of what Fortune did, and one which China also celebrates. There is still today a very close collaboration between Edinburgh Botanical Ga Gardens and the Botanical Society in Kunming, in, Yun in Yunnan. Very positive exchange. So then, in 1848, he was hired by the British India Company to do this mission to steal the, the plants. Now, as I say, China had the virtual monopoly on tea production in the world. At that time, foreign companies could not invest in tea production in China. It was entirely run by Chinese. So the East India Company couldn't go there and make a plantation themselves in China. And they saw how profitable this commodity was in Europe. So they, they said, the only thing we can do then is to steal the plants and plant them in India in places we think they will grow successfully. So they chose uh, northeast India, Assam, Darjeeling for this, where the geography was similar, the weather was similar. <clears throat> now, he was given 500 pounds a year plus expenses, which is not a very large amount of money but he was allowed to sell all the non-tea plants he brought. 
So they, they were worth a lot of money. And his uh, assignment was not only to steal the plants, but to, to find out the entire manufacturing process. You know, how, how it is grown, how it is cultivated, when it's plucked, which parts of the leaves to use, the whole manufacturing, fermentating process, all the tools that were necessary. The East Indian Company said, we want all of this because we want to reproduce it exactly in India. Now, in China, this was a state secret. It was illegal for a foreigner to go to these tea gardens, tea plantations, to learn about the technology. Even worse, of course, to, to, to steal any of the plants. It was completely illegal. And the first opium war had only just ended, and there were only five ports in China that were open to foreigners to live in. But foreigners were not allowed to go anywhere that was more than one day's travel. So you could live in Shanghai, you could go inland, but you had to be in Shanghai th that evening. You couldn't stay overnight, because China wanted to restrict the movement of foreigners. So of course, for Fortune to do his mission, he has to disobey all these rules. Because for him to complete his mission, he has to go for a long time to many different and remote parts of China and um, uh, stay there and spend a lot of time to obtain this, the seeds and all the information. So what he decided to do was he would play the role of a um, uh, Mandarin from the west of China. I mean, you know the Qing Empire was enormous. And in the west of China, just like today, there would be people who look very much like we do, the, the big noses. So he posed as, uh, can we say, a Uyghur or, or you know, somebody from the west of China. He was one foot taller than most Chinese. So, of course, he didn't look right. And, of course, all of us foreigners, we don't speak Chinese properly. We make many mistakes. But because he came from far away, he could be forgiven for making mistakes because a Han Chinese would give some allowance for such a person just as they give allowance for people like us. So he turned himself into a, a Mandarin. So for this he has to shave the front of the hair, he has to have a Mandarin's hat, he has to put in a pigtail. So he didn't grow a pigtail, he just fixed one on. And he hired a servant. So he then, he leaves Shanghai and he starts his mission. So th this is not Mr. Fortune, but I, I just wanted to show you, <laughs> this is what he would have looked like. This was the, 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 the uniform he would have had, okay? So he arrives at the tea plantation with his servant, looking like this. And of course, he doesn't know what uh, reception he's gonna get. But as it turned out, the, 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 the people who ran the plantations were extremely gracious. He explained that he was an official from the far corner of the empire. He had heard about this famous tea, and he wanted to come and see how it was made. And they were very gracious to him. They opened the door. They showed him all around the, the gardens. They showed him around the manufacturing procedure. And he repeated this in all the places he went to. So I cannot really tell you how he was able to, to pull this off. I think I can say that the, 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 the people that ran the gardens, they were open-spirited, they were very proud of what they were doing, they wanted to share uh, their skills, and they were not suspicious of him. And, and I just was thinking today, in those days there was no radio, there was no television, there was no newspapers. Maybe they didn't know there had been an opium war. Maybe they didn't know that China had lost the war to foreigners. Maybe they didn't know there were any foreigners in China. So it didn't occur to them that this person could be anybody different to what he said. I I'm not sure, I'm speculating. But he was able to, to, to pull it off. So this was Anhui Huangshan. This is the first place he went to. So it's 400 kilometers from Shanghai and no foreigner had been there before. Okay? I mean, it's not allowed to go there. It was illegal to go there. So, 
he made a very important discovery right at the beginning. The people in Europe thought that green and black tea were different, but he discovered that they were the same plant, but the black tea is fermented, but the green tea is not fermented. So here's the green tea and here's the black tea, but the plant is, is the same. He found this out very, very early. So he went to many plantations in China, in Fujian, Guangdong, Jiangsu, and remember, He's got to collect these plants and these seeds, and he has to preserve them. So he has brought with him dozens of special uh, bottles, and he's using the very latest technology where it is a sealed container with a certain ash below it. So once you put it inside this container and seal it, it will be, it will be kept, it won't mold. So he, he's doing this all the time. So he's collecting a huge amount of these bottles. So here are some images of what he would have seen. Now these would be taken end of 19th century, so not at the time that he was there, but I think the process didn't change. So he would have seen images like very much like this. So... Yeah, I, 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 as I say, well, how was he able to, to succeed? I, I think most of the credit has to go to the good manners and the welcoming spirit of the Chinese people. Of course, a lot of it is to do with his own <laughs> cleverness and his ability to disguise himself, but I think most of it we should give the credit to the, the Chinese side. So he collects 10,000 seeds, 13,000 plants. He packs them in these special cases and he sends them off from Hong Kong and they have to go to Calcutta. So this is a very long journey and he gives very strict orders that the, the, the containers must not be tampered with in any way. They must just be kept as they are and exposed to the sunlight. So they make it all right to Calcutta. Then they're being taken from Calcutta to um, Allahabad and they're on their way to, to, to Darjeeling and Assam and then there is an official who's very curious, what is this very important top secret uh, shipment? So he by mistake opens the case. And as soon as he opens it, of course, the, the air gets in and the plants are spoiled. So the first shipment is ruined. Can you imagine all those months of effort? Uh, the, the plants are unusable. But fortunately, Mr. Fortune is a man of great determination and he hadn't stopped with the first shipment. He was continuing. He was going on to, to new places. So this is uh, Fujian, Wuyi Mountains. So this was the place he went next. And this is very famous for its black tea. So this is where he went. So he did it all again. He did it all again. Now, uh, Fujian, as you know, is, is uh, Southeast China, it's very, very mountainous, it's remote, and it's rebellious. So it was quite dangerous. There were different warlords, there were present uprisings. He had to carry a pistol to protect himself, but he still, he still uh, continued. And the peak of his exploration was when he met these monks, Buddhist monks in a temple, and they showed him Da Hong Pao, and this is the most expensive tea in the world and it is worth more by weight than is gold. And when uh, Nixon came to, to China in 1972, Chairman Mao gave him 200 kilograms of this. That is the greatest present that Mao could give to a visiting leader. I mean, giving him the most valuable commodity that China has. So that's what it looks like. So the second time, the second shipment uh, went by the same route, but this time they didn't make any mistakes. They weren't going to repeat the mistakes. So these shipments arrive in Calcutta, and they go to Assam, Darjeeling, and the plants are planted in the earth there. So it wasn't simply the plants that he brought, but as I say, he, he brought with him eight 
Chinese tea experts, and he bought all the equipment that was needed to process the tea. Okay? So the, 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 the Indian tea industry, it did exist before, but in a very minor way. But after this, it, it took off in a big way. So here is a plantation owner in Darjeeling, and here are his workers. So you can see from these figures that after the tea arrived, so we're in the mid-1850s, suddenly the Indian tea production rockets up. In, in just a few years, you see the exports. In 32 years, they went from 183.4 tons to 35,274 tons. And these were all shipped back to, to the UK. So this is one of the ships that Richard referred to, and the British government subsidized the, 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 the journey. So now the story moves to, I want to say UK and Ireland, because Irish people are the second biggest consumers of tea in the world after the Turks. British are the fourth. So he turns the British and the Irish into tea addicts. So this is an advertisement for the East India Tea Company in, in London. This is the uh, wharves in, in London where they're taking the tea off the, the ships. And in the lifetime of fortune, India surpasses China in, in tea production. Uh, Sri Lanka also becomes a major tea producer. So uh, my uh, grandfather, um, some of you may remember him, he was a missionary in Manchuria from 1897 to 1942. And despite living in the home of tea, he insisted on drinking Lipton. So his uh, servant, every three months, had to take a horse car to the Trans-Siberian Railway and then take the train to Shenyang and buy three months worth of uh, the Lipton's tea bags and then take back to grandfather and he would drink this every day. And I'm very ashamed to tell this story to my Chinese friends because they cannot see how a foreigner could live in the kingdom of tea and still insist on drinking this stuff with milk, of course, which is a bus. It's not tea at all. It's uh, another drink. But since most of you are not Chinese, I think I can tell the story today. So this would be a sales place uh, in early 20th century in, in the UK. Now, Fortune, having finished with China, continued his explorations. So he went to Japan and to Taiwan, and he collected many uh, plants and flowers there. And of course, going to, J to, to Japan was also a very hazardous undertaking because Ch Japan only opened to the outside world in 1868. So it was not an easy assignment for him. And the US government also wanted to start a tea industry. So they hired Fortune to come and, and start one for them. But unfortunately, the slavery was abolished in 1865. So the, the, the free labor they were going to use didn't exist anymore. So it didn't happen. So he settled in London. He wrote books. And when he died in 1880, he was a wealthy, a wealthy man. So here's one of the books he wrote. And here's his uh, tombstone. So it's for each of you in the room to decide what you think of him. Was he uh, the greatest thief in history? Or was he an extraordinary explorer? He was a very brave man, very adventurous. He was an excellent botanist. He explored many places Westerners had never been to, in fact, foreigners had never been to. He was at great personal risk to himself. He could have been killed. He could have been kidnapped. He could have uh, contracted a disease and died of it. He greatly enriched the gardens of Europe and the knowledge of people in Europe. And at that time, the, the intellectual property system that we have today didn't exist. So 
in the strictly legal sense of the word, what he was doing was not illegal. It was immoral, and he shouldn't have done it, but it, you, know, you couldn't take him to a court at that, at that time. So now, this is his legacy. We have consumption, 2020, of 6.3 billion kilograms. It's going to be 7.4 billion by 2025. You see Turkey is number one. Ireland number two, Iran number three, Britain number four. And, you know, Turkey and Iran are Islamic countries. So, you know, alcohol is either banned or limited. So if we take them away, we see that Ireland and Britain, they consume a lot of alcohol. But still, they, they, they drink, they drink uh, so much tea. And just to go back to my beloved grandfather, he was a teetotaler, like most Presbyterian ministers. So he didn't drink any alcohol, so he drank tea just from morning to night, you know, breakfast, mid-morning, lunchtime, afternoon, evening. Uh, his uh, members of his congregation would come to tell him of their troubles and their afflictions. So what did he do? Of course, he boiled some tea and served it to them and drink it with them. So, um, no, there are many uh, Irish people like that. Anyway, that's the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention and welcome your questions. <clears throat> so, like him or love him, uh, Robert Fortune was the quintessential Victorian. So, who has the first question? Any questions, please? Yes. How did tea come to all these other countries, like Japan? You think of their tea ceremony. Were they, at the time, buying their tea from China? Did they develop their own? And how did it get to places like Iran or, um, or Turkey? Well, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, I mean, these were China's neighbors. They would have imported a lot of Chinese tea. And then Japan also grew uh, a lot of tea itself. So. Um, I'm sure if you've been to Japan, you know their tea, tea uh, culture is extremely sophisticated and there are all kinds of different varieties and, chi and Japan also exports, exports tea. But as, as for Iran and Turkey, I, I think that is the result of trading companies, probably British or originally, but also French or Italian or German, who would have bought the teas in India or in in the big European capitals, and then exported it. And uh, they being Islamic countries, of course, uh, tea is an excellent product to sell to them, tea and coffee, because it's allowed by Islam. So, so what were those countries doing in maybe 13th, 14th centuries before, before all this happened? Were they importing tea themselves, maybe? Uh, Next question, please. Sorry, as they say in the <laughs> Chinese foreign ministry, yes. <laughs> Another question down here in the middle. Hi, a very quick one. I'm just genuinely curious. Is the reason that we drink mostly black tea now um, just a function of the fact that the first shipment was spoiled um, before he went to Fujian? Um, well, of course, uh, green tea was always available in the UK before and afterwards. But the um, East India Company did uh, tests, and they found that for the British palate, green tea was too um, light, wasn't bitter enough. So if, if they just found British and Irish people pre uh, preferred this, uh, this uh, thicker taste and uh, added the milk and added the sugar. And as I say, for all my Chinese friends, this isn't tea at all. I mean, it's, it's, it's absurd to add anything to tea. I mean, tea, the drink of tea is the, the tea leaf and the water, that's all. So they consider, for us to call it tea is, not, is really a mistake of language. You know, it's, it's another drink. Yes, yeah, but the, the demand was for black tea, so that's the main product. Another question in the middle here. Uh, 
I've got a double-barreled question for you. Uh, first off, you, you said that when they went to India, he brought 10 tea experts with him. Um, who are these experts that were enticed out of their native country against the law? Is this, a, is this an Edmund Hillary Tenzing situation where the white man takes all the, the glory and the 10 guys that did the heavy lifting uh, and had the expertise kind of get a, get a footnote? That's the first question. And I guess the second question is, what was China's reaction when they realized that the gig was up, that their IP defenses had been breached? Uh, well, the answer to the first question is, sorry, I, I meant eight, not ten, eight. Uh, now, the reason he took eight was that, in a way, they are more important than the seeds or the plants because they have the knowledge of how to grow the, 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 the leaves and then turn them into this commercial product for tea. And you're right, they are more important than Fortune was. Uh, so this was part of his brief from the East India Company. They didn't only want the, the physical plants, they wanted the knowledge as well. Now, you ask uh, how he persuaded them to go. Well, I assume the answer is money. He, he just offered them uh, salaries that they couldn't imagine at home. And as you know, Chinese uh, travel all over the world. Uh, you know, when I was in lived in India briefly. Uh, I went to some homes of um, Chinese who lived there. I remember in one of them, um, I was sitting in the sitting room and there was a picture of uh, Krishna on the wall. And another wall, there was a, uh, a statue of the Buddha. And then on the other wall, there was a crucifix. So, <laughs> <laughs> the Chinese in India had all the bases uh, covered, you know. So, uh, <laughs> okay, your second question, uh, what did China do when she found out? Well, as you know, the 19th century was a century of humiliation for China. Uh, she could not compete with the Western powers uh, in the military sense, diplomatic sense, economic sense, financial sense. So when they found out, of course, they were deeply uh, angry and disgusted, but they had no met method to take revenge. They couldn't send uh, Navy SEALs to Darjeeling and, you know, <laughs> burn down the Indian tea plantations. A question from me is, are there any statistics about how successful the strategy was in reducing uh, accidents in the, in the cotton mills and looms of uh, northern England? Well, I, I think very successful because the, the tea became the, the uh, favoured drink of the, wor the, the working people in Britain. Uh, also breakfast, uh, mid-morning, lunchtime, afternoon and evenings. And of course, it's much uh, safer than alcohol. So I can't give any figures, but I would say it was, it was very important. Sure. Another question over there in the, in the annex. I just wanted to ask whether you put the milk first now, <laughs> and how about your grandfather? Um, uh, grandfather put the milk in first, but remember he's sitting in his little parish in, in Manchuria, you know? He doesn't have this terrible rich aunt staring at him. But I'm afraid for me, because of the rich aunt, I have to put the tea in first and, and the milk second. Uh, she's left too big an imprint on me, I'm afraid. There was another question down here. Thank uh, you. Sorry, but, but, but if you visit a, 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 a working person, uh, which I, I did often you know, in my career, of course, you've got to switch. So when they bring the tea out, you must pour the milk in their cups and your own before the tea. That's a very complicated question. I, uh, it would take too long to reply. <laughs> Next question. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, a, a question just on how much risk uh, Mr. Fortune faced. Had he been caught, was the penalty death? Was it imprisonment? Was it fines? What, what risk was he running personally? I think he was running risk every day. I mean, uh, he could have been uh, informed. I mean, the, the tea garden owners could have informed about him. Um, he would certainly have been put in prison, and then it would have become a diplomatic matter. And whether the East India Company had sufficient leverage 
with the British government to intervene on his behalf and, and get his release. As you know, there were many cases like that in the Qing period, and in some cases, the, the, the foreigners were executed. So I, I think the penalty would certainly be execution, but whether or not the British would have gone in to bat for him, that's the question. Another question down here. So when, when did the Chinese find out? This is Mr. Robert Fortune, who stole the tea. First question. The second one is um, the tea that we just tasted. Is it some kind of masala tea? Because I can taste a hint of Indian flavor. Yeah, we, we, we asked the, the, the club to prepare for you a 100% Indian taste tea. So I'm very grateful to the manager, and he told me the, his Indian chef prepared it. So it's 100% authentic. And yes, it is masala tea. And uh, as I say, I did, did live in China, in India for some time. And uh, in the summer in New Delhi, it's 42 degrees, and we constantly have power cuts. So you are sitting in your chair, you are sweating like a pig. You know, you, all you want to do is go to sleep. And then our driver, our chauffeur, would arrive with a, a big uh, tank of masala tea, uh, hot and sweet. And we would all be given this to drink. So suddenly you wake from your stupor. And it's better than a fan or air conditioning. And you resume. So, so I found that when we did train journeys, it's the same. You stop at some station. It's 40 degrees. And the ladies on the platform will sell you this hot, sweet, Masala tea, it's like the sort of standard, standard drink, so it's very appropriate for us to have it. On your first question, I'm afraid I'll have to refer to my friends again in the Chinese Foreign Ministry. And, uh, so, next so, ne sorry, next question, please. One follow-up. So the very first taste of tea for British is actually Indian masala tea. Can, can, can we put it this way? I'm, well, the, the, this masala, this is a Indian tea, so the, the tea that the British drink is not quite the same, but if you go to Indian restaurant in, in Britain, they will give you this. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you for the masala tea today. If there's a sentiment that we've all really enjoyed it, then perhaps it's something we can look at putting on the menu at the FCC. <laughs> I think it's a nice touch. <laughs> um, so that's the first thing. Mm. Um, and secondly, uh, Mark, it would be such a pleasure if you'd be involved with us in creating our own FCC blend of tea. No. Um, so speaking on behalf of the F&B committee, um, it would be a pleasure. Something we've looked at for a while is, um, goodness, there's so many stories, so many chapters of conversation here, so much British um, and, and so much Indian and so much multicultural eclectic community, um, wouldn't it be wonderful to create our own tea? So, Mark, it would be a pleasure if you'll join us in that journey. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, delighted. Question over here in the far side. Well, thank you. Uh, just wondering, you, you said he became, or he died very wealthy. Um, did he have subsequent deals with uh, the East India company uh, or, or was he you know on arrangements with some of the tea plantation owners or was it through his books or his or his botanical work that uh, he made as well well as you know the, in 1857 they, they had the Indian mutiny and <clears throat> the mutiny was the greatest shock to the British Empire you know that the Indian soldiers rebelled against their own officers and it, the shock was so great that the British government decided to to take over direct control of India and push out the East India Company. So from that time on, it no longer had the power and the wealth that it, it had had before. So no, I, I, he didn't continue to work for, for them. I mean, he came back to the UK, you know, he became an independent scientist. And as I say, he was hired to go to these other countries uh, and he, he received money from that. He received money from his books. <clears throat> he was a very popular speaker, lecturer. Uh, but he was not an employee of anybody else after that. Another question down here, front row. Thank just a, a, a question on the uh, process. He got the, the seedlings and he got the, the seeds and whatnot and he transported it to India. How long would it have taken before the first crop of Indian tea became available? 
Well, as I mentioned, the, the East Indian Company had already started growing tea in Assam before Fortune went, but the scale of production was very small. So his first shipment was ruined, there was no use, but the second shipment w was, could be used immediately. So I, can, I think we can say within a year, it, it started to, to flower and produce a crop. So it, the payback was very rapid. Any more questions? No. Uh, hi, Mark. It's, <clears throat> is this working? Uh, just, uh, hi, Louise. Um, it's just a delightful story. Um, I mean, d delightful from the point of view of, of uh, the globalization of tea. But I wonder if you can set this in the larger context of the kind of botanical explorations and, um, and sort of illicit, perhaps, from local perspective, uh, collections, botanical collections uh, that, were, that preceded this. So I think the Kew Botanical Gardens were started by um, say collections that included Stanford Raffles and others. And, Hong Kong's own botanical garden is an example of this sort of uh, drive to collect and propagate um, uh, not just commercial plants, but uh, all, all forms of plants. Um, sort of an early, early impulse towards biodiversity. But do you think was um, fortune? Do you think fortune's popularity? Uh, was in part because he celebrated this, this sort of, as you, were, you described it, very Victorian enterprise. And how, how do you look on it today, the Victorian enterprise of uh, basically <clears throat> expropriating the botanical uh, resources of, of the world to the extent they could uh, reach the world? Well, this is a very good question. I, I think we have to look at it from both aspects. I mean, I think Fortune was typical of many Victorians of his generation. They were full of ambition. They were very energetic. They were very prepared to take risks. They were prepared to go to these strange countries with difficult geographies. And I think most of what he did, we should praise. And I think China would praise a lot of what he did, especially the first uh, the visit with the Royal Horticultural Society. You know, the, the exchange of knowledge and plants and so on between China and the foreign countries. And you're right, it, 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 it enriches both sides. And as I mentioned, there's, there's a very strong exchange now between the Royal Botanical Gardens Edinburgh and the Kunming Gardens. Um, so that's the positive side. But the negative side, as you mentioned, is the fact that Fortune was an arrogant man. He was an imperialist. He, I don't think he thought very well of Chinese people. And his motive was to, to earn money for himself. And he, he wasn't interested in giving China a proper share of what he'd taken. And so this is a very uh, unattractive aspect. But in the Victorian age, this is what a lot of British people did in, in India, in China, in Africa. Um, they used the fact that Britain had this enormous empire and navy and officials everywhere, and they were able to do things that they couldn't have done without, without the empire. So, um, I mean, I, I don't want to speak ill of my esteemed grandfather, but um, my father didn't think well of him. You know, I, I always admired my grandfather, but my, my own father didn't speak well of him. And I said, well, why not? He said, look, China has a much longer civilization than we have. They have their own culture, their own literature, their own way of thinking. What right do we have, barbarians by comparison, to go and implant ourselves and, and give them our particular religion and say it's much better than anything they have. Um, so that, that's a, a Chinese perspective. I mean, my grandfather was arguing once. I think we've got... With a Chinese intellectual. I, I just finished. Mm. 
And the intellectual became angry and he said, why do you keep using this phrase, yellow peril? <laughs> India and China, we have huge surplus populations. We, we should colonize Australia, New Zealand, South America. We have a much more reason to do it. You know, in Europe, you have much fewer people. It's the white peril, not the yellow peril. <laughs> We've got time for one more very quick question. risk of stirring some controversy, and hopefully you won't have, any, won't have enough time to reply. It seems to me this wasn't expropriation, it just happened to be a, a, com a series of commercial transactions at the time, which we now realize with the benefit of 100 and whatever number of years later, turned out to be a very good deal for one side or the other. He didn't expropriate the intellectual property or the equipment, he, he bought them at a price which we now agree was quite cheap. Well, thank you for that observation, not question. So, Sorry. so um, th thank you very much, Mark. It was well, a fascinating talk. Um,